All right, so let's see how this French Revolution unfolds and begins. So last lecture, I was just kind of talking about the, the origins of the French Revolution a bit, you know, some of the long-term causes. And we left off with basically Louis XV, the Seven Years' War. And I made the point that, you know, around 1774, 1775, right around that time period, as Louis XV is going to pass away, how is this going to, you know, unfold? Will the French Revolution still happen? Now, obviously, the answer is yes. Um, but the question is, is how it happens. And a lot of it has to do with the monarch that replaces Louis XV. And that's going to be, of course, Louis the 16th. And so this is an image of Louis the 16th and his wife, Marie Antoinette, um, who a lot of people have heard of. And so I want to talk about their reign and what happens during the reigns of Louis the 16th, who's the king, and his wife, Marie Antoinette, um, and how these events help bring about the French Revolution as well. So that's going to be kind of the focus of this lecture here. And so I guess the first thing, just a couple things about both of them. Obviously, they're both high nobles. Marie Antoinette came from Austria. Keep that point in mind, uh, from a noble family. And, you know, one of the most famous stories of Marie Antoinette that so many people have heard about is this notion of where she said, you know, the people didn't have food in the 1770s, 80s. Um, and, you know, they were saying, you know, she heard people complaining and she said, well, if they don't have uh, um, bread, let them eat cake, right? And this comes off as this callous, you know, uncaring thing. And the question that I always start with in this little lecture is, did she actually say that? And the answer is actually no. Uh, she never said just let them eat cake. She said probably something more along the line of, um, you know, if they don't have the flour used to make bread, let them use the flour to use make cake uh, because there was actually different flours and the flour used to make bread wasn't as available as the flour used to make cake. And so it wasn't exactly just let them eat cake. But that's how perception is so important. Now, we say this so often, perception is more important than reality. Um, in many cases. And for some people, perception is reality. That gets into this whole Orwellian type of idea that I cover le later on in my semesters. Um, but, but people believed now, were there reasons why people had this perception of Marie Antoinette and Louis? And the answer is absolutely yes, right? When you, you know, you have these descriptions of, of Versailles and people living in absolute luxury and how, you know, the elites follow their own rules. Right. You know, we see this today uh, with politicians sometimes where, you know, they set rules for everybody else and then they do whatever they want and then they get caught. And then, you know, it looks really silly because it's like you, you can't have your set of rules for you and everybody else gets a different set of rules. Um, and those were things that were happening. So it's natural you'd get that perception. So what specifically happens during their reigns that helps bring about the revolution? Well, let's go through a few things here. All right, so I told you about the let the meat cake story. So I think that's one example already. Another really interesting event that happened during the reign of Louis the 16th that helps bring about the French Revolution is the US Revolution. And what specifically about the US Revolution helps bring about, so we talked about let the meat cake, the US Revolution. So the U.S. Revolution, of course, you know, um, you know, was that begins 1775, 1776 Declaration of Independence. Um, the, you know, when the revolution began, you know, this is really interesting. <coughs> it's Americans fighting against the British. And at first, the Americans went to the French and say, hey, French, will you help us fight against the British? And initially, the French were like, nah, not really. Now, why would the Americans go to the British, the American colonists? Well, because, of course, you know, to the French, because they know the French hate the British and they might help them. Uh, but the French oftentimes looked down at the colonists. They didn't think they had a really good chance. And so initially, there wasn't that much support to help the American revolutionaries take uh, go on. Then we get to 1777, very famous battle in American revolutionary history, the Battle of Saratoga. And in this battle, you know, there was a bit of a turning point. Uh, the Americans won this battle. It was seen as kind of this turning point battle where it looked like, you know, by now the revolution has gone on for a couple of years. The Declaration of Independence had already been written and people were thinking, yeah, maybe they got a shot. So the colonists go to the French, and when I say the colonists, a lot of this is actually done by Benjamin Franklin going back and forth, 
And eventually, Louis the Sixteenth says, sure, I'll help you. I'm going to help you do this. Now, you know, I oftentimes say this is not the smartest thing. You know, with Louis the Sixteenth, some people think that Louis the Sixteenth is this horrible, evil man. And I often tell my students, he's not really horrible and evil. He just wasn't very bright. There's a difference. And when I say not very bright, you know, why is it not very bright to help the colonists fight the revolution? And I love doing this in class and discussing it with my students because students usually figure this out. But you could think about this yourself for a bit and, and then if you want to pause and then can keep going. But why is this not a bright idea? What he's doing is he's sending troops, French troops, to help the colonists fight against a monarchy. A monarchy that's probably less controlling than the rulers in France. And so these soldiers go to the colonies, they read the Declaration of Independence, they read Common Sense, they read all these documents, they break them back and they go, if these ideas are good enough for these colonists who we kind of thumb our nose down at too very often, they're sure is good enough for us. And so he's encouraging to help a revolution against a big kind of controlling government institution. Um, so it's not very smart from that perspective. It helped the American Revolution a lot. I mean, we were, you know, barely, barely had a navy. We needed weapons and all of that. So it really helped. The other thing is, of course, it's costing the French a lot of money. So while this was a very good um, thing for the U.S. in the revolution, it probably did help cause the French Revolution. So I think that story is kind of interesting as well in terms of why the French Revolution happened. All right, next, a couple other interesting developments that are also still cause of the French Revolution. Um, you know, one of the things that was happening as we get into the 1780s in France is the economy in France was really, really struggling. And one of the financial advisors that he had was this man named Marpa. And this guy, Marpa, an advisor for Louis XVI, basically tells him, just raise taxes on people more. And... <laughs> You know, what's that going to do? Well, that's just going to alienate a lot of the people in France even further. Because when he says raise taxes on people, mainly on the average merchants, the average person, not so much these high nobles. And so that doesn't really help solve the problems well as well. It just creates more economic problems and economic uh, turmoil. So that didn't help. Something out of the control of Louis the 16th, but interesting. One of the causes of the French Revolution is a big explosion in Iceland, a volcanic explosion. People go, volcanic explosion helped cause the French Revolution? Yeah, volcanic explosion helped cause the French Revolution. Why do I say that? Well, because in 1783, there was this big explosion. Now, Iceland, it's not right next door to France, but close enough. And when I say close enough, when volcanoes explode and they're massive, the ash from volcanoes can just devastate crops. It could change the climate dramatically. Um, and that's pretty much what happened during these years. And so the climate got cooler. It was harder to grow crops. And so you had, a, you know, an issue of just not enough food and not enough crops being grown. So I think that's a factor as well. One other economic issue, just to give you some perspective on this, in terms of how much waste there was and the money. So follow me on this a little bit because I want to explain to you this in kind of in a little bit of roundabout way, but it really nails home why people in France might have been upset. The budget. Now, I don't know how much you're familiar with American history and American budgets today, but if you look at our U.S. budget every year, you know, we spend in a lot of money, right? Four and a half, five trillion dollars a year sometimes, right? A lot of money. And if you think of that amount of money, of let's say four trillion, five trillion a year, and you think what just five percent of that is, right? Five percent of something like four trillion or five trillion dollars, and I'm sure it's going to just keep going up and up. Um, you know, you're dealing with money of like hundreds of billions, right? So like five percent of four trillion is like 200 billion, I believe. If I'm wrong on the math on that, I apologize. I teach history, not math, but you get the idea. It's hundreds of billions of dollars, just 5%. Now, why am I saying 5%? You'll see, just again, follow me on this. 
First, try to imagine how much hundreds of billions of dollars are. If I were to give you a thousand dollars, or if I were to give you a million dollars, you'd be pretty happy, right? If I were to give you ten million, you'd be very happy. If I give you a hundred million, you'd be ecstatic. If I give you a billion, your brain stops working. What am I going to do with all this money? So five hundred bill, uh, so two hundred billion is like about five percent. Well, five six percent of the national budget in France during these years was being spent on Versailles. All right, so that would be the equivalent of spending $200 billion a year every year on the White House and Washington, D.C. and all of that. That's insane, but that's what was happening. And so these are the things that are really going to begin to upset a lot of people in France. And a good example of this is just some primary sources. You know, I always like using primary sources. And so just listen to these words. This is a man named Arthur Young, 1787. He's walking around France and describing what he sees there. He says, the same wretched country continues. The fields are scenes of pitiable management as the houses are of misery. Yet all this country is highly improvable if they knew what to do with the property. Perhaps some of those glittering beings who figured in the procession the other day at Versailles. Heaven grant me patience while I see a country thus neglected and forgive me the oaths I swear at the absence and ignorance of the possessors. He goes on the next year, 1788, the, pe the poor people seem poor indeed, children terribly ragged, if possible worse clad than with no clothes at all, and to shoes and stockings they are luxuries. A beautiful girl of six or seven playing with a stick and smiling under such a bundle of rags has made my heart ache to see her. Uh, they did not beg, and when I gave them anything, they seemed more surprised than obliged. One third of what I've seen in this province seems uncultivated, and nearly all of it in misery. So this description, and we have tons of these descriptions, obviously are talking about a lot of the issues and struggles inside of France. So all of this is during the reign of Louis the Sixteenth, and then there's one more interesting story, a story of a man named Necker. And this story is not very well known, but it is a factor as to why the French Revolution begins. It's not a huge one, but who is this guy and why is he part of the cause of the French Revolution? So a man named Jacques Necker, he was from Switzerland, actually. He became one of Louis XVI's financial advisors. And as a financial advisor to Louis XVI, he was different than all the other advisors. He was one who actually said, you know, don't just tax people a whole bunch of money. Stop spending all this useless money. And if you're going to tax people, you know, maybe tax the nobles a bit as opposed to just the merchants and the lower classes all the time. So there was one tiny voice inside of Louis the 16th time period where it was somebody saying something different. Question is, what's going to happen with Necker? What's going to happen with Louis the Sixteenth? And what's going to happen as we get closer to 1789? And how does all this eventually lead to the actual beginning of the revolution? And we're going to pick up on that in our very next lecture. All right, thank you guys.